What we're here today to talk about in this session is the question of the responsibilities, particularly of business, and the genuine crisis in trust of institutions across society, but especially in business. And this was underscored just this morning when the Edelman Trust Barometer results were first revealed in the Financial Times in an exclusive piece that came out today, uh, which has the, it basically saying a record-breaking drop in trusts in 2017. The, the collapse in trust seen in the U.S. was the most stark any country has seen in the 17 history of the trust barometer, uh, which is surveying 28 countries. Uh, confidence in U.S. headquartered businesses dropped eight points to 50%, putting them on a par with Italian and Spanish brands among Americans. Wow. Uh, and, and basically, they're saying, Richard Edelman saying, the why is Trump. Trump is leading to such a decline in trust across the board that everybody's getting tarred with the same brush. Citizens are feeling they don't trust anything anymore. So, so we are done. Well, Thanks. Trump Thanks. is good. I have, I have more introductory comments, but so, <laughs> so we have a CEO of a company that with 13 billion in annual turnover or revenues, as we say in the US, uh, with about half of that revenue in Germany, Auto Group. And this is a company that really puts a lot of thinking into responsibility and behaving differently. And then we have one of the great thinkers about the digital era, Andy McAfee, who's just been doing amazing work for a number of years, very much a part of the techonomy community where you first unveiled some of your most groundbreaking work that led to your first book. I, I think we owe it all to you. Well, we, we told you to write a book, as I recall. <laughs> My partner for techonomy is calling me right now. I think I'm going to decline that. Uh, so, but I want to also mention a few other things to prep for the discussion. Um, in Germany, and these are some, some data that uh, Alex told me, uh, the Forza Institute found that trust in business has been declining 15% in the last year. Uh, trust in corporations is egregiously bad, something in the vicinity of 24% of, 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 of Germans trust business. And business executives are trust even less than the companies themselves, 18%, okay? Now, another thing interesting in the opening afternoon on Saturday, uh, Bo Lotto from the Lab of Misfits, and he was a character, but he's a scientist, and he had a quote that I wrote down. He said, we know from science that we trust organizations that are doing something that is bigger than themselves. That's a very key thought to keep in mind as we have this conversation. And then finally, Anybody who follows business news would have been really jarred in the last week to see the letter that Larry Fink of BlackRock wrote to all of the companies that they invest in. And this is especially important because BlackRock is the world's leading investor. Does anybody here know how much money BlackRock manages? Trillions. It is six, what? trillion dollars in investments. They are so by far the world's largest investor, there's no competition. And his letter basically said, companies now have to be conscious of their social role or they will fail because they will not have a license to operate and they're going to start changing the way they think about their investment practices with an eye to, uh, to investing and giving more support for companies who think about their social role. And he specifically said in this letter, it's partly because we have so little trust that government's gonna do the right thing, it is now essentially incumbent on business to do the right thing. And you know, that's not necessarily always been a good gamble. So, <laughs> so I think I'm gonna, I don't know who to start with because I, I, start, start with I, the I think it'd be CEO. safer <laughs> to start with Alex, okay. So, Talk a little bit about how you think about responsibility at Auto Group and, and, and this question of trust in business mm -hmm. and, you know, why it's such a priority for you. And wait, can I just say one thing about you? This is the most impressive single fact I heard about the Auto Group. They're, they're the biggest e-commerce e company in Germany or just Second about one of, one of the biggest. And they're hugely in the apparel business mm -hmm. and they have a corporate commitment, which the Americans here will be especially confused to learn, they don't ship any of their clothes by plane. No, not only a little bit. 
Oh, okay, hardly any. Okay, but they make a real effort not to ship their, <laughs> their goods by plane. And most Americans don't even realize that the biggest you know, destruction of our, of our atmosphere and, and co contribution to climate change is for any individual is when they fly. It's like you can have all the Priuses you want, but if you fly, you're screwing the planet. And they're trying to do something in their business practice to reduce uh, the use of airplanes. So anyway, go on. Yeah, I can jump in on this uh, particular example or start in a broader way. I think for us it's really a different story than, for example, for BlackRock. Because BlackRock is doing it because they see it's necessary and maybe also for PR reasons, because there is a kind of gap felt in society. Actually, in the auto group, it's, it's in the genes. We are doing this kind of sustainable, responsible uh, strategy already for like 30 years. We started in the 70s and it be because it was driven major, uh, mainly by Michael Otto himself. And so therefore we are simply doing it because we are convinced we have to do it. It's not something we, we want to do in order to impress customers or other stakeholders. Um, taking this example of sustainability with a CO2 uh, reduction, uh, we said to ourselves we want to reduce our CO2 uh, output by 50 percent. Wait, wait. 20 you said that like 12 years ago. They committed to reducing their carbon footprint by 50 percent. And actually, that was we way are in a good way. We've reduced it now by 36, 37 percent. Although now the last 10, 13 percent are rather difficult to, to realize. But this is deeply in our genes. But in the broader scheme, we see the, 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 the loss in trust dramatically. You've mentioned all the statistics already. We see it all over the place. And of course, it's an easy answer. Trump is guilty, yeah? And the politicians are guilty. Any, anyhow, the politicians are always guilty, yeah? <laughs> but nevertheless, I think the question is, what can we do, what should we do in order to, to recreate trust? And in, in, in the deep sense of digital transformation, you all here know in the plenum that we will have some dramatic changes in the next years, much, much stronger than anything we've seen previously, even bigger than, than what we've seen with the Industrial Revolution, because I think it's tiny in comparison to the Digital uh, revolution, revolution we see now, and even the Renaissance was probably smaller than what we are seeing and, and facing at the moment. So therefore, the role, I think, of government, of society will change dramatically. And we have to give answers. And I think at the moment, a lot of people simply say, oh, by the way, but everything will be balanced down the road and everything work out, will work out. But honestly, it will not be the case. Because of the technology improvements, we clearly see the jobs will change in a, such a dramatic way. Well, you're sitting next to, to the scared. world's leading expert on that, pretty much. But, but do you think... <laughs> Do you think business, if it acts more responsibly, really can have the sufficient significant impact to counterweight the, the, the inaction that we see on governments? Or is it just, is it just PR? Actually, even if it's PR in some instances, I would say it's still good because it helps. Uh, in our case, it's not PR because we, we, we strongly believe it's necessary. Interesting-wise, for us, um, on the recruiting side, it's getting better and better because more and more young people say we want to work for a company who has really true values and where it's not a kind of PR campaign or employer branding simply, but just, okay. Um, can and somebody come help more? Andy with his <laughs> mic thing? I've got I, I can, uh, oh, no, I got it. I got it. If, Keep talking, it, please. Is it, still, is it still connected? It's on, yes. Oh, okay. So, but we see it, it, it's reality. The people are interested in it. We see it also on the customer side. Although there it's still, I would say, small, but more and more customers are looking for companies to buy products from where they say, okay, they are also taking care about social or sustainable. Do so you think it really gives you more business? Yeah, absolutely. At the moment, I think it's not the major driver. But I think down the road, I think this topic uh, becomes more and more interesting. Well, interestingly, you and I were talking yesterday, and you really don't even brag to your customers that much about what you do. Yeah, that's very true. But although we have to say, um, if you would have asked me the same question like five years ago, my answer would have been, no, I don't think the customer will buy from us because we are more responsible than other companies. But I think over the last years, this topic has changed and it becomes more uh, or comes more in the consciousness of people and the end consumer. So therefore, yes, it starts to increase. And we, actually, people talk to me like, to make a very practical example, I don't buy with this big platform in Seattle anymore because they don't pay taxes in Germany. So they have a lot of customers, they have a lot of people working here, but they are not paying any taxes. 
I bound buy now at Otto.de. You hope he, more people think that way. Yeah. I hope it will increase dramatically. So it's the reason why I'm mentioning it here to everybody. Well, okay, that that's. And, and before we go to Andy, one of the more interesting things about the Auto Group is it was a catalog company, as you Germans all know, uh, but there were a lot of other catalog companies. There were a lot of retailers, many, many of which have disappeared. Auto Group, somewhat like Berta, has made a very successful transition to digital and somewhat led its industry as a digital player when so many other companies didn't see it coming, which is just the kind of thing Andy's been advocating and Techonomy's been advocating that all companies ought to do. Okay, so Andy, I'm putting my seatbelt on now. Uh, what do you think about this idea that companies aren't responsible enough and how do you contextualize it in the digital transformation that we're in the, in the midst of. So you and I both kind of watch companies for a living, right? And we've been doing it for a while. We, our careers have been, uh, you know, uh, depressingly long in some ways. And very long, longer there, for me, sadly. <laughs> and we've been, we, we've been listening to this discussion about corporate social responsibility for your entire career and my entire career. Back in my home environment of business schools, we have entire departments devoted to corporate ethics and leadership and responsibility. We try to instill it into our students. Something is not working if the trends that you identified are actually accurate. Whatever we're doing, de Einstein's definition of insanity was doing the same thing and expecting different Well, well you're, you're implying that companies have been acting responsibly all along and they're just not getting credit for I'm it. I'm implying no, no such thing. Oh, okay, good. I'm implying there's a huge e exercise in rhetoric going on right. that serves some purpose. And as far as I can tell, the, one of the main purposes it serves is to make us feel good because we get to scold bad companies. And one of the things that makes us really feel good is, as, a, as a human being with this weird wiring in our brain is a feeling of moral superiority. So we just kind of like doing this to companies. I, I think part of what's going on, a big part of the reason that the trust, like you say, is actually going down so uniformly, so quickly all across the board, that uh, there are a lot of different areas of responsibility here. And, and let me call out a couple of them. Uh, Companies themselves have been doing things that decrease trust. And my exhibit A for that uh, is, again, I'm going to go back to, to Trump and the, and the 2016 election. That was a time, that election was a time for the leaders of corporate America to make themselves heard. And they sat on the sidelines overwhelmingly. I, I really have trouble thinking of a clearer example of when corporate responsibility and leadership was needed, and the, the silence was almost deafening. And I have a lot of respect for some of the CEOs in the tech industry because Mark Benioff and Eric Schmidt and Reid Hoffman were very outspoken about what they wanted to have happen. I disagree with Peter Thiel's view on this. I respect him for at least putting his views out there. What did you think when all the CEOs quit Trump's councils after Charlottesville? After Charlottesville. So you think it after had to a, get that on, bad? After a naked racist display in the streets of America, the corporate councils disbanded. And I appreciate why you'd sit on that corporate council, because okay. you might want to have some influence. Okay, I want to let Alex challenge you or disagree with you or agree with you, but it's good you mentioned Benioff, who I often talk about as my role model in many ways, but certainly he's the most amazing example of somebody who keeps values and even a spiritual mindset in the forefront of the way he talks, the way I would say even he acts, and still is unbelievably aggressive in business and is a sales master and has grown his company, gotten a disproportionate market cap, and succeeded without sacrificing anything of what I would consider his humanity. I, but I, there are I, so few like that. That, that. And I think that's my point, right? And, and so we're engaging in this exercise about rhetoric and responsibility that, that kind of makes us feel good in some ways. I, I, I think it, I, I, I say this, I, I don't know about your actual responsibilities, I believe everything that you're saying. This is a, I find this a largely empty exercise. So in other words, you don't think we should even have the conversation? We should have different expectations, right? I think if we're looking for corporations to be leaders in, in whatever um, social justice movement, uh, we're misplacing that. We need to be looking elsewhere. If we, if we, so it's never going to happen? I'm, no, that's, I'm just saying we're looking to the wrong place for the impetus for those kinds of things. Uh, you know, the, the, the Me Too movement, the Women's March, these things that are actually changing our societies, these did not originate in the business world. The business world has an incredibly important role in society, which is turning out the stuff that give us a good condition of living. If we're asking for them to take on a more exalted role, 
we're going to feel we're going to be disappointed, and that feeling of disappointment makes us feel superior. Yeah, surely you can't blame the citizens though, who are so frustrated with government that they want somebody else to do it. I mean, I mean, or, or is it the employees are going to potentially do it inside companies? And maybe Alex could talk about how that's worked inside auto. But do you think that's part of what might drive it? That I mean, I, I think we I think we should be looking to citizens and voters and members of our societies and our democracies to be identifying the change that we want. But I think this is a kind of, of idealistic or theoretical distinction. Because actually, who's working in our company? Who's working in the auto group? Citizens. And they don't go into the auto group and say, and in this moment, I don't care anything about sustainability or, or whatever. I think our major issue in the digital transformation is that a lot of people on a very high level do understand that there will be a lot of change, but it's so hard to fathom for them. Right. And I think the people who can start to understand better how dramatically everything in society will change, and again, the governments will change, society will change, working processes will change, everything. And, and, and the few people, I think, who have a deeper understanding and can predict somehow the direction are the enterprises. And if corporates don't start to take over their responsibility, I think there is nobody who can do so. Honestly, we have had an election here in Germany. We're fighting now for whatever, four or five months for a collation, which will, um, may come out now. The whole digital transformation doesn't take place in this discussion, only with some titles. It's, it's not on the political scene. They will not give us answers. And I think enterprises, they have, on the one side, really the, the, the ability to do so, and secondly, I, I strongly believe we, a, we have the responsibility. Yeah, I, but I, you know, I want to continue with attacking you with him. I want to join him in that. Sweet. Because, uh, you know, and this is so much a point of your writing, businesses are the ones who are feeling the scope of the digital transformation before anybody else, and mostly have not responded sufficiently to it, which is why your books have gotten such an audience, because companies are so scared, they've got to start doing the right thing. But governments, unfortunately, have generally not felt the pressures of the digital transformation, and in many cases, especially in the United States, have not even seemed to really notice the digital transformation that's underway. So if businesses are, by definition, because they really do have a bottom line, more responsive, isn't it somewhat reasonable to look to them to somewhat be an earlier warning system and take a somewhat more a powerful role in society since the big change that's happening in my, and I think probably all of our view is a technological revolution that's changing everything, how we operate, that companies will be the ones to help the world understand that and adapt to it. I would draw a pretty sharp distinction between most incumbent companies and on one hand and innovators and entrepreneurs on the other. I think those are not entirely separate populations, and your company is a good example of that. But if we're looking for the incumbents to guide us into the new era, uh, I'm going to call it the second machine age because that was the title of our book. If we're looking for the you call it that as often as possible. <laughs> yes, <Go ahead>. right. <laughs> yeah. If we're looking for the incumbents to guide us into that era, boy, we're going to, boy, we're going to miss all the action. Right? The, 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 this is how Clay Christensen made his career. Incumbents miss the big wave. And yeah, but they're look, not all missing it now. I mean, yeah, you, man, a lot if of you look at, look, you should listen to the new CEO of Coca-Cola or the new CEO of Ford. These are companies that have totally realized that if they don't change how they operate, they will go away. So it's not the same thing as what Larry Fink's asking for, ironically. It's right. not actually, oh, we're going to be fairer and more just. We're going to survive because the world is changing. Wait, hold right? on. Are you long or short on the incumbent economy? Well, I'm short on the incumbent economy in general, but I think it's interesting that a number of companies are finally recognized. I mean, they're an early indicator. These guys cut their carbon starting, you know, 12 years ago. But I think a lot of companies are realizing it now. I think there's been a huge mindset shift among leaders about the digital economy. They don't know what to do, but they totally realize everything's changing. I mean, how could they not after what, the numbers that Scott Galloway showed of the disproportionate market caps of the digital companies, I mean, that's but, the but kind that, of thing that yeah, gets but their does attention. Does that come out of any sense of responsibility to their societies or a survival instinct? I, I just think well, we're these mis things ought to I, go in parallel, ideally. I just think we're miscategorizing this. Of course, there's a business imperative going on that's forcing the incumbent economy to realize what's going on 
uh, because of the efforts of people in this room. I, I, I see that as separate from making, you know, for, from a sense of responsibility. Okay, well, I like the fact that you're up here and keeping us from just muttering pieties, I will say. What about uh, somebody from the audience? We've got nine minutes left. I would love to hear thoughts, comments, questions from anybody if you have any, or you, you're, you're numbed into silence. Okay. Uh, does anybody have anything they want to say? No. Uh, oh, okay. I get the, do we have a mic for this person? Can we get a mic over here? Oh, thank you. Okay, just give one second. Thank you for running. And identify yourself. Hi, I'm Stefan Scherzer from VDZ in Berlin. Um, what can companies and society do? We're talking about the responsibility with education. Because I think the main challenge we had last night, uh, the challenge of democracy, the challenge of voters, how do we involve people? So, and many education systems are so broken. Elite systems, closed shops. So what, what, what answers do you have yeah, both in the of US you. And Yeah, I'd like to hear Germany. both of you on that. That's a very pragmatic question. Thank Great you. Question. Go ahead, Alex. Sure. Uh, I think, uh, from my point of view, there are at least two directions, or maybe even more. Uh, the one thing is I think we have to speak up, also as enterprises, to talk about it, because education is, is a key, yeah? uh, the natural resource. It's, especially in Germany, we have the only one is between our ears. And actually, our education system is somewhat similar to the system I have uh, seen like 30 years ago. There were not a lot of changes, although we know society and business and everything has changed. Uh, I think we have to speak up and to have to, have to address it to politicians, etc. But secondly, what we are doing, especially to get our arms around what does digital transformation really mean. We are at the moment developing a tech education program, which we want to pilot in, in a few months in which we will then roll out for all 50,000 employees down the road, which is a very state-of-the-art thing. And honestly, it has not a single direction to educate, maybe coding or whatever. But it's in total, it's like a 50 hours program where we all want to give the people, everybody in the organization, an idea what digital transformation really means. Because again, I think the most people are scratching on the surface and they do not dig in what it really means and how big the changes are. And I think this is our part of responsibility to, to educate our people. Honestly, from there on, the people are also responsible for themselves to take care about certain other educations. We cannot do everything, but at least we want to help them to, to start in into this topic. Yeah, this is a great question, thank you. And I think the, the most important thing that the business world can and should be doing, and it's doing it already, I just don't think enough, is put pressure on the existing educational systems. And there are lots of different ways to do that. One is to go meet with the deans of the universities and the colleges in your area and say, look, you know, I, I need computer science majors. Help, help me with your curriculum. I think an even more profound way is for businesses to turn their backs on the existing educational system and start hiring people who come with very different kinds of skills and credentials. So we're starting to see this a little bit back home in the States where at least some companies are saying, look, I don't care where you went to school. I don't care if you went to a prestigious university. What's your GitHub score? Did you complete the Udacity course in machine learning? Can I use these very, very different signals about, your, about the quality of you as a, as a person, as opposed to relying on these kind of tired, old-fashioned signals that we get from the existing educational industry. So please increase that pressure. Hi. Hi, Esther Dyson. I don't want to be, well, I will be unrealistic, because I think we need to start thinking about this in a more fundamental way. I don't think we need more digital education. I think we need more human education. If you talk to senior managers, they will tell you the problem with their employees is not so much that they can't code, but that they can't manage. They can't think long term. The challenge of digital is it makes us more and more short term in terms of measuring, in terms of communication, in terms of reactions, in terms of how many people are sitting here on their cell phones. Do you think that applies to companies as much as individuals? Totally. It yeah. applies yeah. to politicians totally. who look at votes and look at being reelected rather than what they're doing for the country. It applies to businesses who are focused now on their stock going up every day or every minute. It applies to people. It applies to tests. We, we're becoming, in a sense, addicted to measurement 
rather than to long-term results. Esther, while you have the mic, I'm curious, what do you think about this idea that businesses ought to take more of a lead role in social transformation? It doesn't really matter what I think. I, we were talking about this at breakfast. Collective, people can speak through their government sometimes, uh, especially if they're educated enough to understand what their government is up to. They can speak through their purchasing patterns. And so the real question is, collectively, are we going to speak to business? Are we going to speak to our governments and say, we want you to build a society, a country, we want you to build an education system, we want you to build companies that will serve us in the long term rather than satisfy our immediate short term. But in the end, you're saying it's really up to the citizens slash customers to understand that's what they need and demand it in every context. It's sort of the, the responsibility keeps going from place to place. The people are responsible to do that. We're responsible for educating the people. Who is we? But the more each of us does as an individual, and speaking through DLD or the platforms you have, to make people understand that they're becoming short-term and fundamentally self-destructive because we have such power now, we can use it to satisfy ourselves short-term rather than to build things long-term. It's really a question of time. Okay, well, that was an interesting response. Uh, I, I, I can't help but point to Scott Galloway's presentation before we finish and his insistence that we have to break up these four tech giants uh, and essentially accusing them of fundamental irresponsibility because they're simply trying to do what they're meant to do, in his view, make money, but it's having a very toxic social impact, in his view. And, and Andy, what do you think about the idea that we should break up uh, the big tech companies? I categorically disagree with it, right? And again, David, our careers are long enough to realize that we were having this exact same discussion about IBM 35 years ago. We're having this exact same discussion with Microsoft. 20 years ago. We were having this exact same discussion about... Yeah, but he thinks those were salutary things that the government went after those and, and no, it they, led to... No, Microsoft, led to reform. Microsoft did not go away. Here we go again. Microsoft did not vanish from, uh, from prominence or from... He the, said in his let talk let me, that me, let, if wait, Microsoft on, had not finish. been attacked by the government, it would not, that we would not have had uh, Google's uh, success. Basically. No, I think that's a very bad misread of corporate history. Microsoft missed uh, search and they missed mobile, and that's why even though they're still a profitable, successful company, we don't think of them as having a stranglehold on the tech industry or on our society these days. So the pattern in high tech is really clear. It's dominance and then disruption. And the only interesting question to me is, are, are we finally breaking that pattern? Do we have this set of companies that's gonna have eternal dominance? And if history is any guide, the answer is no. Do you think those companies, as a general rule, are responsible? There, um, my co-author, Erpen Yolfson, has a really nice way to think about this. He says there's a three-part test. Leave alone technical antitrust law, because I don't know anything about that. It's a three-part test for whether or not we should be worried about a big, powerful company. Number one, how are they doing it with competition? And all right, they're pretty squelching competition. You're not going to launch another social network. So there's some grounds to be concerned there. Number two, innovation. Those companies are in the top five or ten R&D spenders in the world. So the old-fashioned notion of a lazy monopolist that stops innovating, that does not apply. Amazon's about to open a store in Seattle next week where you fill up your bag and walk out. And it's hard for me to argue that innovation is in a bad place with these companies. And then number three are consumers. Are all of us better or worse off because those four companies are out there in the world? I find that a profoundly uninteresting question. We're better off. Maybe, yeah. maybe I can give you also a quick answer from my side on this. Maybe it's a little bit surprising because, of course, if we would have a breakup of Amazon, I think it would be in our favor. Yes. Yes, it would but be. But I think, honestly, this is a, it's, it's a kind of solution out of the last century. And it's not addressing the real topics. And because even if you would break up these companies, the topics which are scaring the people and where the trust is going away, they will remain. They will only be at different other places. And I think overall, uh, we will lose ground. I think it's not a good idea. This again leads back to the question, what could be the future answers to address this responsibility in a much better way and not taking uh, really solutions? And, and before, since we're out of time, 
Is there a better way? I mean, do you have an idea for what the answer there would be down the road? No, I, I think the first topic is really to talk about it in an open way and to see, is there any real value to it? And I think we are not in complete agreement uh, on this. And I think we have to have this kind of discussions. And then I think forces out of the society, out from the investors, I think they're uh, important in order to address a topic. David, well, aren't, aren't Apple and Google, for example, two of the most uh, highly regarded brands and trusted brands in the world? Uh, that's uh, without question. If you're yeah. sitting in China. Okay, so, so, so hold on. So let's break them up because I'm uncomfortable with them. Okay, let's, let's, let's ignore them. I love that we touched on this. We can't talk about it anymore now. I will say I think it's extremely healthy that DLD put this conversation on the stage, and we need to hear more about this question of the responsibility of companies, even if we get argued against, because we just have to hold more institutions' feet to, the f feet to the fire, and I think that's what the Edelman results are suggesting, that institutions in general are perceived, rightly or wrongly, to be failing society, and we've got to be talking about why that perception exists and what could be done to make society work better. So we got a little start here. Yeah. Thank you both for helping.